Good morning, congregation, and welcome to Trinity News. I'm your host, Emily Wilson, informing you on all the latest and greatest in Hey Neighbor happenings. Holy Week is coming up April 11th through the 15th, and we want to make sure that you are in the loop. So join us for our Holy Week noon services happening on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday in the Oxmoor Sanctuary. You get to hear from the guest speaker, and then we'll have lunch afterwards. You can also join us for our Monday, Thursday service happening at 6 p.m. in the nave. And then again for our Good Friday service happening at 6 p.m. in the Oxmoor Sanctuary. We've also got a lot of worship opportunities happening Easter weekend, and you can check out the full listing of all the ways that you can worship with us at trinitybirmingham.com Easter. Now learn about more ways that you can get involved here at Trinity. Hey Trinity families, we are so looking forward to seeing you at our annual Easter egg hunt on April the 9th at 10 a.m. at our Trinity West Homewood campus. It is a Hey Neighborhood event, so that means we want you to come, but we also want you to bring your neighbors so that we can have a whole morning full of bouncing and egg hunting and sweet treats all together on the night. So we hope to see you there. Bye. Well, congregation, that's all I have for you. Be sure to check back next week for the latest and greatest in Hey Neighbor happenings. I'm your host, Emily Wilson, and you've been watching Trinity News. Trinity News. <laughs>
and celebration of the wedding of Hannah Talley and Ford Robinson yesterday, as well as in loving memory of James Neal Attaway and Franklin Duke Robinson, and in celebration of what would have been the 51st wedding anniversary of Linda and the late Verl Wessel. And so we give thanks to all those who sponsored those beautiful flowers. Uh, today we are continuing our follow series that's carrying us through this season of Lent in preparation for Easter. And Reverend Reed Crotty is preaching on the fifth of those five core commitments. What does it mean for us to witness to our faith? What does it mean for us to share our faith? I think it will be a timely and important word for all of us to hear. Uh, I invite you as you're able to stand for the chiming of the Trinity, followed by our opening hymn, Go Make of All Disciples. May we join our voices and hearts in affirming that faith which we have received, that faith in which we stand, in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
You may be seated. Lent is a time to learn how to travel light, to clear our lives of clutter that we may create space to know and grow in our awareness of ourselves and of God. We pray that God will grow his likeness in us during these days of Lent to free us from our brokenness, give us courage for our journeys, and prayer offers us that space. It is a time to be still and to know that God is. As we offer our prayers today, I remind, the, remind you that if you have a prayer concern, you may share that with a card in the pew rack, uh, or you may call the church office or go to our website and give your prayer concern there to be shared with the prayer ministry of the church. I also remind you that our prayer garden is open daily as a place of reflection and of prayer. As we pray today, we want to give special memory and thanksgiving for the life of Jane Bird, who died on January the 24th. We offer our sympathy to her family and for her friends. Also, our sympathy and prayers to Jennifer and Casey Ray and family on the death of her father, Larry McMullen, on March the 24th. And to Ken and Kay Stonaker and family on the death of his father, Costin Stonaker, on March the 29th. May we prepare now our hearts as we pray. Good and gracious God, you loved the world so much that you gave your son for our sake. In him you have spoken words of comfort, walked with the clean and unclean, the loved and the unloved. You have shared wisdom and brought healing and challenged the status quo. Through him you spoke your word of life to us. You walked that painful road to a cross you shared living water and the bread of life. You died for the sake of all to bring salvation into the world. In Jesus, you have planted your, your love like a seed in the ground, which sprouts and grows and spreads that love to all of your creation. And so today we come with humble and grateful hearts, knowing that it is not because we have loved you, but that you have first loved us and sent your son to us to make it possible for us to come to you. And so nothing in our hands today we bring simply to the cross, simply to your love, to your mercy, to your forgiveness and grace, we cling. Gracious God, open our hearts so that we may be able to admit to you the fullness of our lives, all that which is beautiful and good, as well as that which is hurtful and hateful. We confess that we do not always follow the way of Jesus. We love with conditions. We judge, we condemn. We do the things which we should not do and fail to do the things we should. Forgive us, we pray, when we follow the paths that do not lead to life. Turn us to the right path that your love may flow over us, through us, into the world. Give hope and courage, O oh God of hope. You call each of us to bear witness to your abundant love in a frightening world. All around us we see the signs of brokenness and struggle. Strengthen us that we may not give way to despair or despondency. Give us hope to believe that you are at work, and then give us faith and courage to follow you to those places where there is hurt and where there is distress. May we be faithful witnesses to the gospel. May we speak words of peace and comfort, doing deeds of compassion and mercy and justice. Lord, today we pray especially for innocent victims of violence and war everywhere. Cure your children's warring madness. Bring our pride to your control. We pray for the wounded, the injured, the sick. We pray you bring comfort to all who are dying and grieving, that you would renew the hopes of those who despair and grant courage to all who are anxious or fearful. O oh God, who knows all of our needs before we ask, hear the unspoken prayers of each of our hearts. For it is in the name of Jesus we pray as we join in singing. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your reign come, your will done on earth. Bye. 
Well, again, we're so grateful that you're here with us in worship, especially if you're visiting. We know it takes some courage to walk into a new church for the first time. We'd love it if everybody would take a moment and sign the attendance pad located there in your pew, pass it down your row. It's a great way to learn the names of your brothers and sisters that you're worshiping with this morning. Um, And it is especially appropriate on the day in which we talk about witnessing to our faith, sharing our faith that we celebrate Um, Two baptisms today in both of our traditional services, but this morning uh, you're in for a real treat as we welcome Cherry Murphy along with her husband Ned into the body of Christ. Ned and Cherry uh, worshipped with me years ago at Alabaster first and started worshipping with us online uh, and then started driving all the way back and forth from Inverness to worship with us Uh, in person, and just a few weeks ago, I made a decision to become a part of the church, and as part of that, uh, Cherry now comes before you, her new new church family, uh, to be received into the body of Christ, into the church uh, that is Catholic and spans uh, spans the world, and we are so excited about welcoming her into the family of Christ. Uh, We actually baptize a lot of adults around here. I told Cherry, I promised I'm not going to carry her around the sanctuary. Most of the time uh, when we baptize adults, they choose uh, for all sorts of reasons to be baptized in our staff chapel. But I really encourage Cherry to consider being baptized as a part of our worshiping community because I know it would not only mean a lot uh, to those of us uh, who have been baptized to remember our baptism, uh, but also I think uh, her Uh, willingness to do this and uh, the reminder of what the Holy Spirit's doing among us as a church family would probably lead somebody else uh, to make a decision for Christ. And so I'm just so thankful for Cherry uh, and for her and Ned coming to be a part of the church. So on behalf of the entire church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, say, I do. Do you accept the freedom and the power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with Christ's church, which Christ is open to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, say, I do. And Cherry, do you wish to be baptized in the Christian faith this morning? If so, say, I do. And to both of you, uh, will you do all in your power as members of this church family to support the ministries of Trinity with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, say, we will. Awesome. You kneel down here. Let us pray. Almighty God, pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and the one who receives it, to wash away her sin and clothe her in righteousness throughout her life that dying and being raised with Christ, she may share in his final victory. In his holy name we pray. Amen. Ned, will you come over Come over and put your hand on me. There you go. Chao Hui Tao, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Cherry, may the Holy Spirit work within you that being born of water and the Spirit you may rise to be a child of God, a true disciple of Jesus who walks in the way of life eternal. We give thanks for all that God has already done in your life, all that God will do, and we celebrate with you becoming a part of this church family. In Christ's name we pray all these things. Amen. I invite the church to stand with Cherry. Church family, will you do all in your power to support and encourage Cherry in her faith? Will you join with me in this commendation prayer? We rejoice to welcome you as a member of Christ's holy church and the Trinity family. With you, we renew our vows to uphold it with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. With God's help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ that surrounded by steadfast love, you may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. Church family, we give thanks for Ned and Cherry. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ned. Bless you all. Okay, have a good seat. You may be seated. 
There is a lot going on in the life of the church as we draw closer to our Easter celebration. A lot of that is in your bulletin. I encourage you to take that with you and pay attention to it. Uh, We are continuing uh, to collect for our Lenten offering. As you know, that offering not only supports our outreach ministries here at Trinity, things like our Afghan refugee response, our food share ministry, our backpack ministry, but it also goes to support our 22 mission partners around the Birmingham area and uh, beyond. Every dollar that you give towards the Lenten offering goes to support our neighbors in need. You can uh, mark Lent or Lenten offering in uh, the subject line of your check, or if you're giving online, you can also choose that as a category. A reminder that after every worship service in this Lenten season, we have a time of communion. If you'd like to take part in communion this morning, we invite you to come forward and sit in this bank of pews immediately after the service. Uh, And then starting next Saturday, our Holy Week adventures begin. We've got uh, an Easter egg hunt over at the West Homewood campus on Saturday. Next Sunday will be Palm Sunday, um, and it's going to be a time of renewal and recommitment for all of us as a church family who's continuing our follow sermon series. And then I'm so excited that for the first time uh, in three years, we'll be able to have our uh, midweek or midday Lenten services on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at noon here in uh, the Trinity Sanctuary. We'll have a brief time of worship followed by a fellowship meal uh, down in uh, the fellowship hall. And then, of course, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Saturday, uh, six services here on uh, the Oxmoor campus on Easter Sunday morning. I know there will be a place for you and your family uh, to come and worship the risen Christ. Now, one of the ways that Jesus promises to show up is when we gather in his name. It's in the face of our brothers and sisters in Christ. I invite you to stand as you're able and to greet your brothers and sisters in Jesus. Let us pray. Loving God, you give and give. You didn't think the life of your son was too high a price to pay for our salvation. Jesus' life was an example of sacrificial giving all the way to the cross. As we give this day, we want our gifts to impact the world. But even more, we want them to bring glory to Christ, who lived and died for all your children. Help us to not hold back anything. We pray in the name of your Son, our Savior and Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated.
We're reading through the Gospel of Matthew together as a church family. As we give honor to the reading of God's Word this morning, I invite you to remain standing as we hear from the 28th chapter, Jesus' great commission to His disciples. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may have a seat. Kids, come on up. Hey. Good morning. What? You did. So fun. That is awesome. Hey, Arden. Good morning, Corbin. Hey, Wesley. Goodness, look at all these kids coming forward. For a minute, I was afraid that I was going to be up here by myself. So I'm so happy to see all of you guys this morning. And why don't we give a wave to our friends who might still be on spring break and are watching at home? Good morning, friends. Can't wait till y'all are all back here with us. So I thought I would get who, who's going to school tomorrow? Who are our school kids going back to school tomorrow? I thought that I would get us ready after our spring break, since some of us may have been on spring break, get us ready to go back to school tomorrow with pop quiz. How's that sound? Ugh. I know, I promise, but this one's going to be fun, okay? Okay. Promise. Okay, so I'm going to hold up a picture, and I want you to tell me who or what is in the picture, okay? So here's the first one. Who or what is this? A doctor? A doctor or a nurse? Uh Uh-huh. Nurse? Tomorrow? Doctor. So how do you know? Oh, you're going to be with a doctor tomorrow? Yeah, probably. Okay. she's wearing the heartbeat thing. How do you know that this is a doctor? Grace, say that again. Because there's a ear um, thing in it. A stethoscope. Okay. How else do you know this person is a doctor? Clothes, okay. The clothes she's wearing, her white coat. Okay, I have another one for you. All right. What about this one? Teacher. 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 Teacher? Well, how do you know she's a teacher? Anna? And she has books in her hand, right? And the coat. And she's in front of a blackboard, so that probably gives us a clue that she's a teacher, right? Okay. Here's the last one. Firefighter. How do you know that this person's a firefighter? Putting out fire? Yes. How else do you know? The water? The clothes. What he's wearing? Dead giveaway, right? And water, yes. And safety clothes. That's right. Well, you guys did so, so good, but now, I have a bonus question. Last question of our pop quiz, okay? Are you ready? It's a doozy. 
I wonder what a Christian looks like. Hmm. Let's think about that. Does anybody have any ideas about that, Arden? I wonder what a Christian looks like. Anything. Anything. That's a pretty good answer. What do you think? Pastor Brian. Pastor Brian. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent answer. Excellent answer. What do you think, George? It could be that a Christian could be the doctor, the firefighter, the teacher. Sure. Because it's not what's on the outside, it's what's more on the inside. Mic drop. That's the end. That's the end of this. That's the end of the children's moment. Like, I don't have anything else to say. Thank you, George. So um, I think that's right, George. Um, we're all called to be disciples, right? And we're all doing and saying things that help people to understand who God is and just how much He loves us. So my challenge for you this week is to think more about how we recognize a Christian and to think more about how we act and what we say and do so that others around us know to recognize us as Christians. Does that make sense? Okay. You guys have a great week and so glad to see you. What happened to the prayer? What happened to the prayer? <laughs> Amen. <laughs>
We've been buttonholed by aggressive and overbearing people who seem determined to convert us to their idea of what it means to be a Christian. They can be relentless until it almost feels like being bullied. They have an agenda for us, and they mean to impose it on us. You know, unsolicited, uninvited spiritual advice is seldom appreciated. Maybe they mean well, but the high-pressure approach generally leads to resentment and resistance. We don't like being singled out and made the target of somebody's misguided zeal. So when it comes to witness as one of our membership vows, some of us may be a little uneasy. We don't want to do to anybody else what those overbearing and obnoxious witnesses have done to us. We don't want to intimidate or embarrass or offend anybody. We don't want to try to force our brand of religion on them. We don't want to be condescending or disrespectful. But I would suggest that there's no need to be offensive or obnoxious, overbearing or condescending in our witness. There are some positive, some healthy, some constructive ways to witness. And it is an important part of our commitment. The passage that serves as our text for today is often referred to as the Great Commission. It's the very last section of the Gospel of Matthew. It was Jesus' final words to his disciples before he left the earth and ascended into heaven. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Jesus specifically commissioned his disciples to make more disciples. They were to witness, to share the good news. Now, I think there are a couple of things we need to note at the beginning. First of all, we're to make disciples of Jesus and not of ourselves. The objective of our witness is not to persuade or convince people to become just like us, to agree with all of our opinions and ideas, to conform precisely to our understanding of how they should follow Jesus. The standard or the model is not any of us, it's Jesus himself. The aim is to be like him, to follow him. Jesus is Lord. It's easy to be confused at this point. Of course, we all start with our own experience, with our own understanding, and we can proceed to try and convince everybody else to agree with us and to see things our way. Let me clarify what I mean. The aim of our witness is not to make the whole world Methodist. The aim of our witness is not to get new members for Trinity. The aim of our witness is to make disciples of Jesus, not of us. You know, there are a lot of good churches all around us. Dawson Memorial next door is a good church. All Saints across the street is a good church. Our Lady of Sorrows and Edgewood Presbyterian are good churches. So are Sixth Avenue Baptist and Church of the Highlands and Briarwood and the Greek Orthodox Cathedral and More Than Conquerors and many, many others. Certainly, we hope that the United Methodist Church will have a place for everybody and that everybody feels welcome when they come to Trinity. But the important thing is not which particular church or denomination people join, but they become disciples of Jesus wherever they go to church. And we can be disciples of Jesus in all kinds of churches. Everybody doesn't have to be just like us. A second point is that we should respect God's work in the lives of other people. Methodists of everybody should understand that because we believe in prevenient grace, the grace that comes before salvation. We believe that God is always present with every person and the Holy Spirit is at work in every heart and every mind and every life. We couldn't shut God out of our lives even if we wanted to. God's presence may not be recognized or acknowledged. The Holy Spirit can be rejected, resisted, ignored, rebelled against, forgotten, but God is still there. And the Holy Spirit is still at work 
When we witness, we remember that God was already there and active before we said or did anything. And God doesn't always work the same way with every person. What he does with me may be different from what he does with you. We may not always understand what God is doing in somebody else's life, and that's okay. Are we prepared to let God work with each person in his own way? We don't have to understand or agree or approve of what God does. Well, what about followers of other religions? What about Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, and others? Are we commanded to persuade them to abandon their faith and convert to Christianity? Is that what it means to make disciples of all nations? I read a disturbing article recently. There's the headline. It seems there are some missionary organizations in the New York City and Long Island area that target Orthodox Jews. They have a Yiddish New Testament, a Yiddish translation of the New Testament. Yiddish is a language that was historically was spoken by Eastern and Central European Jews. Yiddish is sort of a mixture of Hebrew, German, Slavic languages. It uses the Hebrew alphabet. This organization manages to get a copy of a synagogue's membership role, and they bombard the congregation by sending everybody on the mailing list a copy of the Yiddish New Testament. Now, the packages list the synagogue as the return address on the mailing envelope, so people will think they're getting something from their synagogue and be sure to open it. There's also an organization called the Chosen People Ministries who are making plans this summer to focus on some neighborhoods in Brooklyn that have a high concentration of Orthodox Hasidic Jews. They're recruiting volunteers to join them all over the country. They've purchased an old funeral home on Coney Island as a headquarters for their ministry. They're going to target those neighborhoods intensively this summer. Well, maybe they mean well, but is this really the kind of witnessing that Christians should be doing? I think not. We should let God, the Holy Spirit, work in his own ways. And his ways may be mysterious to us. But remember, God is already working in every heart, every soul, every mind, every life. And we should respect that. This type of evangelism seems arrogant and deceptive and disrespectful to me. And if I were an Orthodox Jew, I would resent it which would make the gospel less and not more appealing. It would have a negative effect on me. So what does it mean to make disciples of all nations? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I, Jesus, have commanded you. Discipleship is a process that goes on throughout the course of a lifetime. It's never complete, at least not in this world. I like to think of discipleship as the process of moving from being a Christian to being Christian. We can become a Christian in just a moment, but becoming Christian takes considerably longer than that. And all of us have known some Christians who weren't very Christian. The decision to become Christian has to be made and remade every day, and sometimes several times a day. The name for that process is sanctification, which is a great old Methodist word, sanctification, the process of becoming a Christ-like human being of being conformed to the likeness of Jesus, of becoming his disciple. So how do we effectively witness and share the gospel to encourage people to undertake that process? I want to suggest three ways. First of all, we witness by what we are. We witness by what we are. Let's face it, all of us witness to something simply by the kind of persons we are. 
It's not an option of whether or not we witness. It's how we witness and what we witness to. And I know that was ending a sentence with a preposition. That's not correct, but I did it anyway. Our character and our personality makes a statement. All of us, every one of us, we might ask ourselves a very important question. When other people look at me, what do they see? What does the testimony of my life offer? There was a great preacher several years ago named Harry Emerson Fosdick who had a, a brilliant, had many brilliant sermons, had one brilliant sermon he entitled, The Fine Art of Making Goodness Attractive. This is how Dr. Fosdick began that sermon. I think you'll see it up there. Our thought today, however far afield it may ultimately carry us, starts close at home in the simple and familiar fact that nothing so much helps us to live a good life as somebody who makes goodness attractive. We are not forced into goodness, nor exhorted into it, nor legislated into it. We are allured into it. Concerning any genuine goodness in any one of us today, we may be sure that sometime somebody made that kind of goodness attractive. If we're Christians here today, it's because somebody, somewhere along the line in our experience, somebody made Christian discipleship attractive. When other people look at us, is there anything about us that makes them think, that's the kind of person I want to be? In his letter to the, to the Galatians, St. Paul talked about the fruit of the Spirit, which he defined as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When we run across somebody who has those qualities, who exhibits those fruits of the Spirit, there's something about it we irresistibly find ourselves wanting to cultivate those same fruits in our own lives. When we encounter a truly Christ-like person, it has an uncanny way of inspiring us to become more Christ-like ourselves. That's the witness of what we are. And then we witness by what we say. Certainly there's a time and a place for verbal witness to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. People need to hear as Paul wrote to the Romans, how shall they hear without a preacher? And the preacher doesn't have to be an ordained minister always. Any disciple can tell the story. Sharing our own personal story, what our faith means to us, the difference that Jesus Christ makes in our lives can be a highly effective and convincing witness. And the most effective, the most convincing witness is a dialogue and not a monologue. It involves listening as well as talking. It's a conversation, not a lecture. A dialogue rather than a monologue. The one who witnesses doesn't speak from a position of moral and spiritual superiority as an authority who has all the answers, but as a fellow pilgrim on the path of following Jesus. We're making our way together and sharing what we've learned along the way. The witness doesn't do all the talking. We listen as well as speak. It's a dialogue, not a monologue. That's the witness of what we say. And, of course, we witness by what we do. It is true. Actions really do speak louder than words. Without opening our mouths, without uttering a single word, we can deliver a powerful testimony for Jesus. People find it much easier to believe that God loves them when they know that we love them. We can make God's love believable, plausible, 
credible through the witness of our actions. There's a quotation often associated with St. Francis of Assisi. Preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. Words are not always necessary. We can say a lot without speaking. There's a story that one day Francis took a young novice monk with him for what was supposed to be a preaching assignment. Along the way to their destination, they were interrupted by a series of people who needed help in a a variety of ways. There was a man whose wagon had gotten stuck in the mud. There was a woman struggling to carry a heavy load. There was a farmer whose cow had gotten loose and wandered away. There was a little boy gathering firewood for his family. It was one thing after another. Francis and the novice monk never made it to the preaching service that day because they stopped to help all those people. Late in the afternoon as they returned to the monastery, the young novice commented that, well, we never got a chance to preach today. And Francis replied, on the contrary, my brother, we've been preaching all day long. No sermon either one of them could have given would have been more powerful, more convincing than the acts of love and kindness and service they performed because actions do speak louder than words. That's the testimony of what we do. We were commissioned, all of us, all of us were commissioned to witness, to share the good news, to make disciples of all nations by what we are, and by what we say, and by what we do, we can provide evidence and give people a reason to believe that the gospel is true. There's an old gospel hymn that goes, can the world see Jesus in me? Can the world see Jesus in you? Does your love to him ring true and your life in service to Can the world see Jesus in you? We already are witnesses to something, whether we want to be or not. What a privilege it is to be witnesses for Jesus by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Our closing hymn is the great old hymn, I love to tell the story, Twill be my theme and glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Would you stand as we sing together.
If you would like to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion, simply come to this front area pews here and just take a few minutes after the benediction. You're all welcome to stay for that. And now may the road rise to meet you. The wind be always at your back. The sun shine warm upon your face. The rain fall soft upon your field. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the hollow of his hand. Amen. Hey friends, thanks for joining us in worship this morning. Just a reminder that you can click on the uh, link in our video description to register your attendance, or you can just make a note in the comment section if you're watching on Facebook. We just wanna remind you also that if you want more information about things that are going on in the life of our church, to visit us on social media, or check out our website at trinitybirmingham.com. We are so grateful for you, so grateful that you are part of our church family. Have a wonderful week.